the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. Welcome, and thank you so much for being with us this evening. And so we come to the end of the De Stefano Levin era in New Haven. And I call it that purposefully, for I believe that history will record these last two decades that way, as a time when these two individuals, from their very different leadership positions, came together to put New Haven on a new path, a different path, a path of great promise for our community's future. And this really, tonight, really is the end. This discussion marks the last joint event with Mayor DiStefano and President Levin in their respective positions. So what a fitting way it is to close this era, taking a moment to consider what it all means for our community. We gathered uh, this evening to do so in the spirit of the Community Foundation's convenings, which seek to bring the community together around issues of cent central importance to our future, and as Mary Lou said, in the spirit of the theme of the 2013 festival, Dreaming New Worlds. Thank you to Mary Lou Oleski and the festival team for making this event tonight happen. And thank you as well to Angela Powers and the great staff at the Community Foundation for their contribution as well. So the point tonight is not that the De Stefano Levin era has been the first in which New Haven's mayor and Yale's president have worked well together. To the contrary, historians tell us of the close friendship between Whitney Griswold and Dick Lee in the 1950s. And I know from my own experience in City Hall in the 1980s of the mutual respect and affection, as well as the close working relationship between Bart Giamatti and my old boss, Ben Delito. And the point tonight is not simply a retrospective of how over these two decades the city has supported Yale's growth and of the unprecedented scale on which Yale has in turn invested in its hometown. The homes purchased, the campus restored, the payments made, the scholarships offered, the projects invested in, and the new companies spun off. Now the point tonight, at this signal moment in New Haven's history, at this moment of transition, goes much deeper, I would submit. In the De Stefano Levin era, things have fundamentally changed. We have seen an altogether new shared leadership dynamic emerge in this community. We have seen City Hall and Woodbridge Hall, and I'll include 433 Temple Street in that, work together day in and day out to make the idea of a shared destiny into a living reality and a central driving force for both institutions. And perhaps most importantly, we've seen a, a profound shift in long prevailing public attitudes, both within the Yale community and in the broader body politic. So the point tonight is to further our understanding of these fundamental changes and all that they portend for the economic and social future of this community. Because it's only with this understanding that the legacy of the De Stefano Levin era will truly have lasting impact in shaping our future. That's why it's so important that these changes be understood as broadly as possible, understood by all those in the community who care deeply about and are committed to that future. That's why the Foundation felt it to be so important to have this dialogue and why I'm so pleased that you all are here tonight to be part of it. With all due respect to the historians, I'll probably be Yale historians, who will tell the story of the De Stefano Levin era in the decades to come, the two people who know the story best, of course, are right here on this stage. John and Rick need no introductions, to be sure. All that can be said beyond what we all know and beyond what's in the program, your program tonight, is the depth of gratitude that this community owes to each of you for all that has happened in New Haven under your leadership. It is truly beyond measure. And thank you both so much for being here tonight to share your thoughts on this subject. And we are very fortunate tonight to have a moderator who is uniquely well-suited to the task of talking us through this very important conversation. Doug Ray is a senior Yale faculty member and a former senior city official who has written one of the truly great books about New Haven, 
city, urbanism, and its end. Doug is a unique fount of wisdom and understanding and experiences to our city, and we are grateful to him as well for being here tonight. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Professor Doug Ray, Mayor John DeStefano, Jr., and President Richard C. Levin. Thanks very much, Will, um, and we're glad all of you are here. Uh, let's begin, uh, Mayor, with uh, your take on Rick's accomplishments. Uh, over, the, over the 20 years of your collaboration. Sure. I say hello to everybody. I feel like, you know, we probably know, like, most all of you very well. Uh, it's, it's good to be out here today. That being the case, notwithstanding that, I want to be clear, parking meters go till 9 p.m. That was the Board of Aldermen's idea, swear to God. So just be warned, Mary Lou understands this. And I actually want to thank Will for the DeStefano Levin thing. You'll get your $5 later for putting it first. And it's, it's great to have Jane Levin and Kathy DeStefano with us uh, here, uh, here today. Um, and, and, and actually, I say this, um, it's, we, we may have talked before yet or not, I don't know. So I would say three things that I, I thought were, were great uh, about Rick. Uh, and I think one, the first one is, is the probably the most important thing we do as managers is to hire great people. Uh, is to hire great people. And, and for, for the city, but that's, that's meant, uh, is the city would have been able to do its immigration, initiatives, uh, the city wouldn't be able to do its challenge to even save its bank demutualization. Uh, we had a public interest law firm at the law school, uh, fully supported by the deans, everything else. Um, I say that our chief economic development attraction is Bob Alpern at the law school, at the event school. Uh, Bob Alpern, if you understand what's happening in the city, and what's happening at Yale, frankly, you know, having someone like Bob Alpern as opposed to some of your previous deans, is uh, it's just been a huge uh, win. And I'll just give you one more example, uh, is this place. This is an extraordinary place, this gallery. I mean, it is absolutely world class. But you don't appreciate it, you see the New Haven Public Schools. Every New Haven Public School student comes through this building several times during their career in New Haven Public Schools. It is a huge asset. And John Reynolds, John, John Reynolds, I would kiss his rear end on the green anytime. He is my hero. I say, I say that generally. So I think hiring great people has, has been one. Uh, second is the internationalization, to my mind, of the university. Um, the, 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 the change in the student body, uh, the faculty, um, the, the center up on Prospect Street, uh, the uh, beachhead uh, over in uh, Asia at this point. Uh, the internationalization of this brand, I think, is a big deal and brings a lot to this community and attitudes and what we think about. Um, it just imports talent, human, human capital, which is huge. Um, and the third thing is, I, Rick has an affected relationship. And so I'll be honest, and you know, I knew I watched Ben and Jamadi when I was CAO and you were development administrator. Um, I often felt sometimes there's the appearance of relationship and then there's the substance relationship. And the only way you know that is what people do. And it doesn't mean people are bad people or we don't like them or love them or stuff. Uh, but it's been, you know, it's, it's been genuine and it's been real. And the way I think it's worked is it hasn't been transactional. Um, it, it hasn't been a transaction. Well, sometimes it's a little transactional. <laughs> uh, excessively. Um, Hiring and bringing great people, talent, uh, to professional staff at this place, uh, making this a gateway to the world, I think has been a big deal. I, I don't know what you think, you know, whether you think it's as big a thing, but I think it's been a huge accomplishment of yours. Uh, and the third thing, um, it was uh, not affected, uh, even little things like staying on Everett Street. Even though you really hated the fact that I built a school there, uh, I never got a vote on Everett Street again. A vote? You did. Okay. Um, that's my perception, but those, those those three things I think were the biggest. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mayor. Uh, Rick, um, 1993 to 2013, uh, 2003 was kind of the halftime, and in a speech at a university in Cleveland, I think it was Western Reserve, 
Uh, you went on at some length about how wonderful it was to have a strong and willing partner in the mayor of New Haven. And, uh, so let's expand that and let's hear your summary of John's achievements. Well, there have been so many. And well, let me also just add, as, as Todd did, it's great to see so many familiar faces and uh, be among friends and active citizens of New Haven. Uh, that was the young community in this event. So thanks, Will, for bringing it up. Mary Lou, for, for accommodating uh, Will's interest in having us in the festival. Um, I, you know, it's hard to summarize, but let me, I'll cite three things also. Uh, is John's, is John's, uh, what I see is John's really notable. One of them is, let's just talk through this, so that, you know. <laughs> I'm just going to talk over this, folks. The, uh, can you uh, can you please dial it down? Thank you. It's so funny. This the rest of you want to listen to this? It's a joke, so we're laughing. Okay. Yeah, it was a parasite. Let's just go. 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 let us just go Okay. Let's try. Let's try. And if it doesn't happen, it doesn't Okay. Uh, Rick, uh, let me re let, let's remind. I'd ask Rick for his take on the mayor's achievements, and he had begun to answer that. And why don't we just carry on? Yeah. So I hope you can give the respect that any speaker at Yale is always important, uh, which is audience has a right to listen. So one of the things that I think is most notable about, about John is the way he uh, has, I believe, inspired the confidence of most people in the city. I think I didn't vote for it, but just, just have to think. I think we're going to have to ask him. Sir, I think we're going to have to ask him. Sir, I think we're going to have to ask him. Actually, our second largest taxpayer. Mula uh, uh, is an important organization in Fairhaven that we've actually partnered with on a lot of immigrant rights uh, issues, and they've been good partners. And I, th I think one of the things we've learned together, working together, is you know where you have common cause, you work aggressively on behalf of them, and where you have disagreements. 
I think what's really been important is to have respectful disagreements among uh, among us, of which I have more than my fair share. I might want to have. <laughs> you were talking about me. <laughs> he was supposed to say enough about me. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Please. Okay. I, of certain elements notwithstanding, I think John, John has a, a way of really connecting to people in the city. He cares of passion about the well-being of the least advantaged members of our community. And it shows through and all the time. And, you know, we've done so many events together in different neighborhoods where we've, where we've spoken up. I'm always just so admiring of the way he's able to connect and show his empathy, which is not, again, not effective. It's genuine. It really comes from the heart. And, and he, he's able to communicate that. And, you know, it, it, in a way that has given confidence and hope to a lot of citizens in this town. That did, you know, did not happen so easily before. They know they have a leader who cares about them. That's, I think, very important for the family. Um, second, I, I would have to say, and again, his, his third point was about our relationship. I, I think the mayor's courage, political courage, in embracing a partnership with Yale should not be underestimated. He, he um, uh, you know, he took considerable risk in 1990. 495 as, as he as, as our relationship began to build um, it wasn't obvious that this was an easy thing to do and you know that you hear there's still people out there who, who think that Yale makes no financial contribution to the city well actually when you add up the commercial taxes we pay for the second largest in the city the voluntary contributions that we make for for the tour of the city's um, uh, budget and the um, uh, and the and the and some of the uh, and, the, and, the, and the, what comes into the state's um, coffers through the pilot program. This, this, the, you know, this, the city does well by Yale's presence. And what the mayor understood that was that Yale's growth was actually good for the city. That with the more faculty, more staff, more students, and more more renters in the in the neighborhoods, more home buyers, and more state made and more retail business, uh, and it also even, even property expansion by the university turned out to be good for the city because we have there's a payment through a taxes regime, and every time Yale bought a property, we upgraded it, and the assessments went up, so we actually, actually the city came out ahead in most every situation. So he, it, it was not easy for most people to see this, but the mayor understood that this was all, you know, it was, that, that Yale's, Yale's growth has been good. He's encouraged it. He's, he's been our partner in making it happen. And he even, you know, took the risk of coming to us in, in about 1996 and saying that the properties on Chapel Street are going to be auctioned off and we'd like, we'd like you to um, be the only buyer who could buy them all and actually develop them with uh, with some coherent plan in mind. And so we were, you know, we, we of course, stepped up and that's when we brought Bruce Alexander in. And, and of course, he's been a phenomenal part of this partnership. So, the courage to embrace the partnership, which was, in truth, harder for the mayor than it was for the president of Yale. So, so I really respect that. And, and, uh, and third, I'd say that, you know, a notable achievement of the last few years is this, what I think is this wonderful effort we had school reform. Uh, you know, getting a contract with the teachers union that, that, that allowed um, uh, performance of the schools uh, and of teachers to be evaluated and or has worked with all the constituencies to work serious to, 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 to make a serious effort to improve the quality of New Haven schooling. Uh, I think that's going to have a huge thing to pay off. I mean, that, that, you know, the only way out of the cycle of inner city poverty is through education. And I think that's the, you know, everything matters, jobs matter, services matter. But ultimately, it's education that's going to drive permanent change. And, uh, and the mayor's understood that for a long time. And finally, had the political opportunity to act on it back in 2009. And I think we're really, uh, we're really making progress. Don't say it. Uh, Rick, uh, I heard from uh, Jane that you turned in your keys a few hours before this event. <laughs> a few minutes before this event. And that must be quite a feeling. Um, I'd like you for a minute to think back to the beginning of your administration 
and how what your first concerns might have been about building the relationship with John, and a little bit from you and then from John about the early days in which you were beginning to feel each other out and get a sense of who the other guy was. Well, when I was appointed president in, in April of 1993, uh, Chris John Daniels was still with me. Yeah. And the first question asked after I gave after I gave an acceptance speech that actually talked with actually highlighted the importance of of, of working with the city uh, was uh, was was what are you going to do about it? And I said, well, first thing I do when I get off this podium is I'm walking over to shake Mayor Daniels' hand and start this relationship. So we, I was committed uh, from the beginning, and. Um, and then, you know, we, 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 we uh, I mean, we all sort of knew that John was going to get elected, but it just feel, felt proper to sort of wait until the Democratic primary had been resolved before, <laughs> before we had an official meeting. And uh, so we had a meeting in my office in September of 1993. And, um, you know, I declared our intentions to be good citizens and be helpful to him. And, he, yeah, I actually thought about this some more time we were reminiscing about this uh, recently. Uh, he actually had two specific requests for, 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 for you know, which I do not remember. So when I went out with you, you will have some of these when you hear them. The first was, help us to develop a hotel in downtown. And that was a point in time when the old part of Plaza was shut down. And there really was, you know, the, 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 the previous iteration of the study, the colony had not yet started up. There was really nothing. And downtown New Haven, and, uh, it was, it was uh, very suitable for the kind of traffic we hope to attract, attract your uh, business we hope to develop. And, and so, we, so we said, sure, we'll, we'll do this. And then the second thing was to help us with a project uh, that he had in mind, which was a terrific idea of, of bringing school reform and community service delivery together in a single day to sort of create a model community development where job counseling, where uh, pregnancy counseling, uh, uh, health clinics, and, uh, and, and schools would all be co-located. And the target area for this was West Rock. And so we said, sure, we'll uh, mobilize resources and you can use expertise of people here and so forth to accomplish that. Now, it's, it's actually very funny that neither of these two specific projects actually panned out. The, 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 the hotel, we had a whole plan to develop 900 Chapel Street, the new hotel. Uh, building face of the green. But then, then uh, the outside developer came along and, and said, you know, I can redevelop the, the, the building the park plazas in, and you won't be left with a with an unusable building if you build a hotel somewhere else. It was a pretty plausible story. The mayor came back to us and said, okay, I want to do it here. And we were a little in the way at first, but, uh, you know, backed off and supported it, and in fact, helped secure some funding from the government right here to support it. Um, the second one, I think, I think both the mayor and I were uh, quite interested in making that happen, but it, somehow it ran into all kinds of politics out of control of either one of us, and uh, never quite got off the ground. In the West Rock neighborhood. Right. right. Many, you know, we've had many successful collaborations since, but it actually shows that one of the things I say in that speech is, if, you know, if you don't succeed at first, try again. But that, that many partners, and by the way, is a recently published book. You can get it. You can pick it up at Atticus just across the street or, or, or the uh, bookstore. Um, but um, I'd be happy to send copies of uh, But I just, I, I just said, you know, don't be discouraged by failures. You've got to keep trying. I mean, the, 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 the challenges in front of the city are so great that not everything's going to succeed. You're going to try it. And that's kind of been good about it. He's experimented with lots of things. And some of them haven't worked, but so many of them have. How do you remember those early days, John? Um, you know, right or wrong, uh, I came to the relationship feeling Rick had been selected in part because of the uh, killing of Christian Prince on the on Saturday. And what I had viewed as an unsuccessful Yale president uh, before that, uh, the sense of this, you know, so I was to subscribe to them. Um, 
and just what had been a real disconnect between the, the city and the university. And, and I thought in large measure, aside from your many other talents, uh, that, that was a, a big reason for its selection. I probably also came to a relationship with a pretty big uh, chip on my shoulder, uh, which was probably a combination of growing up here in the city where I never felt, and I've told you this uh, in an early discussion, never felt welcomed on the campus. Uh, I lived here, and it was a place you went to. Um, and I wasn't the most radical or weird-looking person in the city. And I, you know, if I felt that way, it was not unusual. It was interesting. I still felt that way after working for Ben for 10 years. And what I, again, felt, uh, you know, a lot more uh, talk about doing things together than substance about doing things. And so I did. I had a chip on my shoulder uh, about the relationship. And I am sure I, you know, came through at uh, the times.
Woods uh, knew, knew them, and um, Rick, uh, actually I remember I had Rick call Dean uh, during the process um, about this, and uh, it was a supportive, uh, good team effort. Yeah, true. I mean, I'm very happy to have Dean, I think he's terrific, but God asked me to help with the career that I told me he was being recruited, asked me to help, I had a couple of conversations with Dean, we, he was very interested, he'd been doing some teaching in, 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 the, uh, in his last job, and so uh, you know, we were able to have some opportunities for him to do some teaching at Yale, which he loves doing, and so it's worked out great. It's great. Is it, is it true that as uh, time passed and the degree of trust uh, between the two of you uh, grew, that you raised the sights a little bit and became more ambitious as you went? I think the city changed and the university changed. I think the challenge and the, op the challenges and the opportunities uh, were better. Uh, late 80s, early 90s, really the early 90s, were tough economic time, right? If you, if you think back, uh, we got into the Clinton years. Uh, state government was flush with money. Uh, we, you know, it was easier to get things done. There was some things began to, to happen. And so, you know, some interesting things began to happen. Uh, the life sciences, the transfer of technology, and the life sciences began to achieve some scale. You know, witness Alexion early, I guess it was this week, I can't remember, it was earlier this week, I guess. Um, you know, sort of, and, and those companies started to emerge. I think the other thing that uh, started to emerge is actually something with all of you is lifestyle change in America, traditional two parent, two family households, non singles. I mean, rental housing began to get hot. I think the city made a smart decision in the late 1990s, which was to take all the class B office space downtown and start converting it to rental. Uh, we were talking um, today, we started doing some things, actually, I think one of the things, one of the first things we worked on that worked out really well, I was at uh, Wexner School today for eighth grade graduation, I was talking about this, and I came out on Foot Street after uh, we did it, which is perpendicular to Dixwell, and there was Elm Haven, now Monterey. Uh, 800 units of housing, 406 high-rises, 400 in garden style, you know, through streets out there, and there are these houses, which are, as I was telling Rick today, they're 15 years old now, in the neighborhood, and it's just gangbusters. Interesting, enabled the northern expansion, I think, of the, the campus as well. We have the famous discussion of the, the cemetery. I think that this, so that, that's, it's an interesting case study of how we're increasingly more ambitious. We, we well, Hope's Monterey was is a whole project, and the project is Hope, uh, Hope 6 project. You know, there's an early stage of our collaboration, but one of the earliest things we did was help with the grant writing to, uh, to sort of make that happen. Well, we, we were there. Right? Yeah, that's why yeah. yeah. That's why I want to So, um, uh, but we, you know, we, we kind of had people working it to help put this together. Jim Farnham, we came Jim Farnham to write the grant for uh, for uh, at, at our expense to make it happen. So we felt a little pride of ownership, even though there was, you know, money for the city and it's done so well. And as that started to stabilize, it just so happened as it was starting to go up. We were in the process of a kind of master planning, as we call the process of not a master planning process. So we didn't actually pinpoint you know, exactly what was going to be built where, but we established guidelines for different quadrants of the university. So what kinds of buildings belong, like any little house, obviously, you can stay with the historic the character. And Science Hill, you can build modern buildings, and you know, the, 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 just a sense of guidelines for what different parts of the university should look like over time, how they should be involved. How signage should change, a whole lot of things like that. So we, we have not paid any attention to what, if you look at the clock of the map of the university looking north of, of with the avatar, you know, would be the, the, it was 9, 12, the 9, 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock part of the map, which was really the part behind the cemetery. And, and, uh, and we, we took, we, you know, there's a sign of the stronger relationship. You know, Bruce and I went over to talk to John and show him before this master plan was in early, fairly early stage of the preliminary thinking, show them what we were doing, and wanted his insights and ideas about it. And he said, 
well, what about that? You know, what about the area behind the cemetery? And, you know, we, we didn't know that. It wasn't ours, you know. Um, but there was, the, there was a site for sale back there. There was a laundry site, which, which we were now at the police station. And it was actually John who said, maybe that's, you know, let's get ambitious. Maybe that's an area you should redevelop and maybe you can contribute to, to, to anchoring this improving neighborhood. And, you know, as you know, with the help the, the uh, uh, health plan here, I mean, at first the police station, the health plan, community center, which rationalizes to college decision, I think. Yeah. Okay. And actually, we built up the, the logic to have two colleges where we're going to put them so that you could and now they can walk between Science Hill and between the two colleges and the gym, you know, behind the cemetery. It doesn't feel like it's in territory anymore. So a lot of it all worked out great. This so, is I did. We never questioned this, but I asked a question. So what did I do to infuriate you the most? I, I have a much better <laughs>
rather than react to it because it's a good thing. And I sort of, you know, always felt part of what leadership's job is to do is, is to explain things to, to publics and to constituencies and to help define them. And sometimes it was my job to stand up for this constituency in the, uh, in the city uh, for things like that. And it's easier coming from me. And uh, my, my strongest challenge was actually 2001. I don't know if you remember that. It was the, the Looney Challenge. I don't forget Marty, good friend, ran these ads. Do you remember them? The two uh, brick pillars with the wrought iron gates with ivy, ivy on them with dollar bills. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we had tested it before. That, that would ever form. <laughs> uh, we had tested it in polling. It was like the public had like completely gotten over it. I mean, I, I, I think it just, you know, it's sort of the substance. When you have substance and it's retail. And I think a lot of the Yale stuff, the home buyers program, the community gardens program, the school of forestry is a wonderful emissary for this, just to work in the schools, really retail the relationship in the community in a, in a nice way, which doesn't mean they always agree, obviously, but just, you know, it provided a context that people were able to say, well, this isn't all bad or all good. It's a little more nuanced than, uh, uh, than that. And, and I, I think there was a recognition that we, we each had our constituencies, we each had our needs. Um, and we were well served where we could to, to support each other in a, in a smart way. The, uh, one, one of the striking things about what you guys achieved or which, what the city achieved is the high quality of the fine grained retail and entertainment fabric downtown, which was just not there 20 years ago uh, and is there in a big way today and enormously improves the quality of life and the attractiveness of the town. Uh, take some credit. Bruce, Bruce gets the credit, I think, more than anything. Well, I was upset about Barnes & Noble, if you remember. Yeah. I was originally upset about Barnes & Noble because of its impact on the co-op. And I said, well, the co-op's authentic, so I complained about that. And actually, I complained to Bruce last week about Lila Rowe. Um, not fitting the uh, formula uh, of, of what we want. I, and I think there's a tension about that. I mean, you know, nothing against Panara across the road. A good friend of mine is Charlie Negaro, who owns Atticus and Chabasso Bakery. Uh, and that, that's market, there's going to be marketplace issues, right? And that's survival of the fittest and, uh, or not. And I think that the university, I'd say, has, has done a wonderful job of taking ownership of retailing in a coherent and positive, hugely positive a uh, positive way. I think there's, you know, there's just got to be caution that there's a rub to that, that, you know, I mean, not everybody may fit the, may fit the formula, but overall, you know, I mean, very, very good. And I, I would just say that to the challenge, as I continue to give gratuitous advice, is, 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 is the keys to his office. <laughs> <laughs> so far, you might conclude that there's nothing left to improve in this town. Uh, and in fact, there are things left to improve. And I, I know neither of you wants to uh, give gratuitous advice to your successor, in John's case, whomsoever he or she may be. Uh, but what, are, what would be at the top of the agenda for you, the two of you? if you were starting out again in 2013 to address major issues in the city. Let's go with Rick first. Well, I, you know, I think some of it is, is continuity. I mean, I, I, I would say, you know, keep the partnership strong because it's been good for the city. Um, pers I mean, pursue the school. Don't let the school reform momentum drop. 
it's that moving. That's going to be an important long run initiative, and it's, it's going to take it takes 15 or 20 years to really pay you know pay dividends. It's, it, it has to be sustained, and um, uh, I'd say um, the the, the um, Oh, oh, and then, and, then, and, then, and you know, and I think you mentioned already, you know, support the police and the I mean, crime is still, you know, crime is way less. It's a third of what it was 20 years ago in the city, but, but uh, you know, it's still more than, it's still more than you know, any of us want. And, you know, support Dean and his, and his, and what, what he, what he, what is a really pretty good police force in, in their, in their efforts. I'm sure you have other. Yeah, you know, you know, yeah, I'll say this. I think we were extraordinarily lucky coming in uh, six months before before me. And while it wasn't like like the deciding factor for me, it was something I thought about when I decided to leave. Uh, was it wasn't just about leaving, but it was really providing the next person the same opportunity I had coming in. Uh, because I I, I think you, you you get something from that. And I actually think sometimes people do stay too long. And, in my case, many people would agree with that. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, people, people do. And, you know, just going forward, I guess I point to a couple things. I, I, I think one of the things that's worked really well is we figured out together how to grow wealth out of the university's core competencies. And I, I think the university and the city, sorry, second all that, I, I think this city and this, the university can sit down and think about where the economy is going how to grow the economy. I, I remain, I, if you saw the jobs report for Connecticut that came out yesterday, um, there was a um, 1,000 net new jobs, but what was interesting to, you know, to be 2,400 private sector, uh, 1,400 loss in public sector, many of them in Southern Mary as well as in the city. Uh, you know, it's a very mixed economy, and I think New Haven and, and the city should step back and think about where's work going to be, how are we going to create wealth, how are we going to create value and how we both retool to do that, because we've both been here a long time, they're new regimes, and they'll have some great ideas about figuring out how to do that. So I think rethinking about the economy. One is I think, um, and this is key, and I think we need, the, the two institutions need to put their muscle behind us. I think the state has been just stupid in not investing in transportation infrastructure. I um, when I see some of the investments they make, and they allow Tweed to languish, uh, and won't build a damn parking garage at Union Station and do, do something. I mean, I, I mean, Springfield's nice, but I don't want to go there. I mean, I grand central, and I mean, you know, I, I just think it's ridiculous. And I think it's incredibly short-sighted, and it has to do with perceptions of political problems in East Haven that don't exist even the damn mayor of East Haven's for this now. Um, and, you know, and I'll, I'll, mention, I'll mention one other thing. Um, not that I have thought about this or have strong feelings about uh, um, about this is, um, is, well, you know, when we did, you know, a lot of people were like, you know, why did you wait 15 years to do school reform? And, I, you know, that was the point of view that, you know, it was great the way they did school reform in Washington, D.C., and New York. Every candidate uh, running for mayor in New York right now is courting the teachers' union. And, you know, payback's a bitch. It's a bitch. I and mean, they're going to have payback in places, some of these places where they do reform. And that's why I thought what the teachers did here, what the Dr. Mann School Board we did here, of trying to do this collaboratively made a lot of sense because maybe you have a chance of persisting, right? Saying you're going to do something is one thing. Actually making it happen, right? It's another thing. It's like raising a kid. It's challenging. Uh, and it takes persistence. And you need persistence of effort. I think there, so I mean, to, to me, school reform, although I was a little angry about this too, the charters. I, I, I mean, it, there was a moment of opportunity with school reform in 2008. Now I got to give credit to New York and Washington, because New York and Washington got into a huge fight. AFT was looking to make nice someplace, and you know, we should be the place. And that was easy to get out. And, and it, so it was, a, it was a moment to take advantage of. I think there's a moment similarly right, right now, and it has to do with access to primary and mental health care in the, uh, in the city. And I'll say it this way. I thought we were able to do something with immigration um, and to a less, much lesser extent gender equity issues, but with school reform uh, that was great for New Haven, but also just shifted the dial a little bit nationally. And I think New Haven has the capability to do that because we have this international broadcaster 
in the city. We have capacities and talents of it. And we have every problem that you have in a big city as well as every advantage. Um, I think we have the opportunity to do something with that now. And I say, I say that because fundamentally both clinics, community clinics, are troubled in our tough business. Great clinics, tough business. I have an incoherent healthcare system in the school district right now where I see 20,000 kids a day in their uh, siblings who I don't yet have. The hospital has a merger. I, I, you know, I've said this to Mark, and I've said it to, to Bob Albert, I think the uh, Howard Avenue, you know, it's just it, the primary care facility is just not good. Uh, and they know that, and I think they reckon with the, with the merger, there's an attempt, there's an opportunity to address that, reconceptualize that. Uh, and I know part of it's because of the nature of the med school, which is, you know, not general practitioners, more specialists, blah, 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 blah. I think there's a great opportunity. Um, that's how I do my public policy. So. I, I actually think there's a moment to do so, and I really, this is one of the things that why I do regret leaving, is being able to think about things like that. Because, right, most of the time you spend, you know, fixing the huge blunders you make, and of course the people who work for you, your favorite staff means just just tell me what you were thinking when you did this. Um, I just want to know. <laughs> tell me. I want to know. Curious. So, anyways, um, I, I think I think we ought to have a discussion about how we're growing wealth and how we're going to grow wealth. And maybe that's not just a New Haven discussion; it's a regional discussion. Uh, the second thing I I uh, uh, really point to is this is just insane with these transportation assets. And the third is, I think we could probably do something really cool with access. It, it, it'll save money uh, for the institutions involved and, and for the residents of the city. Uh, it'll make us a healthier, smarter, better, better place. That's an important my Christmas tree. You know, if I may, yeah, I, I agree with you about healthcare and the way you characterize it, but I would actually characterize it even more broadly because, yes, we need better access and better, sort of better, more rationalized primary care. There's no question about it. And the medical school is really the right place for it, but it doesn't mean the, the, the hospital and the, the, it shouldn't happen. It should happen. But New Haven becoming a major destination medical center is much closer to reality today than it was 20 years ago. I mean, the, the level of cooperation and trust and teamwork that now exists between Bob Albert and Martha Borgstrom, it, it's another sea change in, in, in what was always a very tendentious relationship between the medical school. And at the hospital today, it's really seamless. I mean, really, they really have a fabulous working relationship, and we are upgrading. I mean, we have hired great specialist physicians and surgeons in the, since Bob Albert's been here. It really is getting much stronger, and we're, we are over time drawing more referrals from you know the whole Northeast and even around the country and around the world, where we have world class people. And that you know, if you look at you know the American economy, I mean, healthcare is a is still going to be a growth sector over time as a remaining population. And so we talk about where jobs are going to be created. Yeah, biotech companies are great. They're dynamic, but they don't employ that many people. But, you know, the, the, the medical care delivery system employs a lot of people. And, and uh, uh, I think that's a source of future potential. If we go back to John's uh, mention of transportation, uh, uh, Rick, it, it's my impression that the two-career family has become more and more important in Yale's hiring. So we have two high-powered people, uh, both of whom need first-class jobs. Uh, and New Haven, for all its wonders, is a relatively small market. So, and many of our competitors are located near larger cities or in them. So it seems logical that we need to improve uh, transportation so that New Haven is closer to New York measured in time and inconvenience than it is now. Uh, that's a big lift. It would require enormous public expenditure, I think, or very substantial. Uh, do you think we can look forward to a major effort by the state and the university and its many allies in that field? I don't think the state is interested. Questions. I know that we've tried. And uh, I, I don't think it is. And I, I think, you know, it's not so much the money. It's, again, I'll go back to where I was using my school reform. It's persistence of effort. The virtue we had. It, you know, Tony Blair said this wonderful thing. And I you saw it. He said that when you arrive, uh, you're most popular and least prepared. And when you depart, 
your least popular and most most prepared. Right? Is that right? Did I get that right? And I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I think you sort of get, you know, we all do in life, right? Yeah, you know, whatever you're doing. And, and, and I mean, for me, it, it's like, um, you know, what I would wish is this persistence of effort. We had a virtue is that we could never find other jobs, Rick and I. And so we were just like, here all this time. <laughs> You know, the normal schedule for training between Japan and New York in 1900 was one hour and 20 minutes. And there were some faster express trains. This is with steam motors. I, I, I mean, the, 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 it's, it's, it's appalling that the, the two cities, 75 miles apart, don't have faster transportation. We have just absolutely absurd. And, 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 I actually learned from Jane from some conversation with the Metro North Order that we could, that, that um, you know, I've always thought, and I think it's true, that the roadbed needs tremendous amount of work. But even with this roadbed, better equipment, we can cut the schedule. Yeah. It would be really important, I think, to have that happen in the next, the next 20 or so. Um, I, I, we have some questions from the audience, and the gentleman who left early uh, will be greatly disappointed to miss uh, this question. How does or doesn't the recent purchase of High and Wall Street fit into the broader town down there in which you're constructing? I mean, I don't know. I never saw it as like a big deal. I thought they should have paid more for it. And at which point, Bruce sent me an email saying I insulted his integrity or something. He got so emotional. It was, it was just a business already discussion. Been you know, sometimes you wake up the next morning and you're smarter. Um, I, I, I did, and I mean, to me, you know, look, my, my job, you know, if I was to say to, 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 to Peter coming in, it's the best thing Peter can do for the university is what I think I've been saying for 20 years, is make it the best university in the world. You know, make it the best university in the world. We're going to benefit from that. And and to me, if, if this is the idea of being a big deal, frankly, I mean, it wasn't like I ever had a resident in Mayor's Night Out and say, geez, that wall in High Street. I mean, it just, it just wasn't. I mean, they do care about things like, are there enough cops in their neighborhoods and are they walking beats? They do care about... Uh, whether their their kids are reading on grade level, I mean, the, the, to me, I, I guess you know you can have to go have a fight about it, but to me, that's that's so 1960s. You know, right? <laughs> you know, think, think, about, uh, think about what's on those streets, right? The Sterling Library, Yale Law School, Beinecke Library, I, I mean, uh, Berkeley College. We we are not going to be tearing those buildings down for many ever. I mean, hundred years, a thousand years. I mean, those buildings are here, so. It's, it's not like we're going to all of a sudden eliminate, you know, to build right across the street and, make, and, and eliminate that space. It's going to remain open space. The, the building's already frame it. It's, it may, and they're going to last a long time. So, so that the worst, it, and we don't even, we have no present attention, but, you know, at least the option is now open that you could have the pedestrian treatment that we've given to the one block in front of the library, to all four blocks. And would that be such a thing? It's been in the end. Nobody uses us as through traffic. Or through traffic. In the end, I think the argument is really about did, you, did the university pay a fair price? So, you know, I mean, that's an argument. I mean, that's a fair issue. What's fair? Right? What's, what's fair? And again, you know, my, my feeling had always been is that, like, this was an important deal to them. I had wanted the $3 million in my budget to balance it this year. Um, I mean, we're going to see each other on another day, even though other people may be sitting in these chairs. If you're going to make every deal the deal, you're not going to have a relationship, you know, it's right? Like, you know, Kathy, right? You know, some days you win, some days I win. I mean, it's, it's, it's just the nature of, it's no, seriously, you know? I mean, you, you can't be an Ayatollah on every issue. <laughs> Is it not what you say? <laughs> Kathy, can I give you my microphone? <laughs> Changing subjects. Um, this is another audience question, um, and it's a tendentious one. Uh, now that Yale's unions control the Board of Aldermen, uh, 
how would you calculate or evaluate the threat that this poses to our city? <laughs> let's, say, let's say something about you. It's unions, first of all. I mean, this is an unmet touch on this, but you ask, what is another what is another area of substantial improvement in this city? And, and, and that is that we have, after a couple of pretty bad false starts, and a couple of contract negotiations that turned into strikes that were very contentious, we've really worked out a hugely better relationship with our unions. And, uh, and since 2003, you know, had no disruptions. And, but more than that, we have really, really good conversations and a really strong sense of partnership uh, around university matters. And, um, you know, as it turns out, in a certain way, the, re the reason that happened is we finally figured out they were right about something. They were right about the, the call for respect. Every one of these fights, you know, talk about give us respect. Well, you know, what, what I finally was able to figure out that respect translated to much more direct access to higher level people at the university on a regular basis. And so in 2003, when we set up that very contentious contract, we set up a mechanism whereby the unions would meet regularly with people, the union leaders would meet on a very regular basis with people at the vice presidential level of the university. And, and today, in the last four or five years, uh, that's involved, you know, a meeting that occurs monthly at least and often more often with three of the university's vice presidents. And Hey, it's just changed the game. There's a, there's, there's a good, strong personal relationship there now. And we work out problems. We work things out. Um, I, I think, uh, so that means that the unions being aldermen is, actually doesn't feel like a threat to me, or to the university, and I don't think it should feel like a threat to the city. These people live here, and they're active citizens. John? I love you know, when people talk about the Democratic Party, one party town, and anybody knows our Democratic Party, it, it is a series of factions um, organized almost tribally uh, over past affronts, injustices imposed on people, and, you know, just, it, it is, it's, it's, it's fractious, it's, and it's organic. I mean, uh, it's, it's not... Um, as party politics used to exist years and years ago. Um, I think that, um, I think we talk a lot of time more about process than substance. Um, I think that the way you practice good politics is you have a mayoral election in 2013 and you say, what do we want for our public schools? And, you know, have an honest discussion about trying to get there. And frankly, most people don't find that particularly interesting and don't, frankly, vote on education. Um, but you, you try to have that discussion. You, you do talk about how you're going to pay the bills here. I, I, would, I would count uh, among my biggest failures is the inability statewide to build a coalition about tax structure and, and growth, um, how land use, tax policy, transportation infrastructure all relate to growth that healthy suburbs uh, revolve around healthy center cities. Um, problems with the existing tax structure, you know, our keno based tax structure. That, uh, you know, I really feel like um, we tried to do that in 2001, the Property Tax Reform Commission, and in the gubernatorial race. And it, it just wasn't able to, to do it, right? You can have great ideas, but your politician's job is to sell them. you got to sell them. Um, so I, I, th I think, you know, what all of us should do is bring these discussions, you know, not to label union or not union, but to what's important to families, and that's it. It's a good place to go from. I mean, that, that's how I look at it. They're always going to be factions. They're always going to be groups. They're going to assert, and over time, it changes. You know. so we're we're going to talk about it years ago. We, we talked in the 90s about trying to, you know, and I think spend time with Don Rowland talking about utilization of the tax base. You know, I mean, it, it, it just makes sense. It's, it's crazy now. It's dependent on municipalities, but the disparities in wealth, uh, opportunity, or some great you know, cities in the south. Uh, this is uh, an audience question for John. Uh, there are actually more than one 
University in the greater New Haven region. And um, Yale is, of course, first among equals, you know, historical and other grounds, I suppose. Uh, but what promise is there in cooperation with other institutions of higher learning in the greater New Haven region? Yeah, the <laughs> American Pace and President Southern's here. Um, Gateway is really important to us. It is community's workforce development tool. What we may have thought Gate Community Colleges were 20 years ago are not what they are today. Uh, they're really the place that people go to get retrained, get certified, uh, prepare, for, uh, prepare for work. Um, I, I felt strongly about locating Gateway downtown because I, I felt it needed to be at the center of what we were, uh, it also, and also solved the land use problem quite honestly, very nicely. Uh, but that wasn't the motivating factor, really was to have it here on the center of the employers. And, and I think actually Gateway um, has, has and continues to be hugely important in the city. You know, I, 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 I need something from the Board of Regents, so I may regret saying this. I think Connecticut has a crazy structure. Actually, I think I said this the last Board of Regents, the one who only came to Connecticut twice a week, uh, the president uh, of the system that did it. And I, so I said, I think we just met, is I think it's incoherent governance structure for our state university system. We have this Board of Regents over these four colleges. I mean, these guys virtually have no flexibility over their budgets. They're hiring. Uh, I mean, and their the course of offerings. I mean, it's like if you wanted to design a system to not work, not that it doesn't not work, but I mean, it just makes it incredibly bureaucratic and hard, and I don't get it. By the way, I'm just going to have to document your expenses now. Jeez. No, that's, that's how they fix things. Um, so, I, I mean, I actually I actually think Southern is limited in a way. Actually, we did have a discussion, and I, I think that um, evening degree programs are an interesting thing. It's where I thought uh, it's at Mary, where Southern could be competitive. And, you know, we've been doing some other things, which I, you know, we did with uh, Steve up at uh, UNH, and we're working to do with Mary right now about uh, campus-based schools, which are good, but I, are not the overarching powerful things. I think just seeing these institutions as workforce development, and I'll actually say one other thing. I, I was appalled. I never, I never thought about this before. Two years ago, I found this number that only 18% of our kids who graduate from high school and matriculate into college graduate after four years. And I was like, what? You know, I mean, I never asked that number or thought to ask that number. I mean, it goes up in the fifth year. I mean, I, I, I think there's a job to be done here because we get so hung up on test scores, which are important, blah, 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 blah. Um, there it is again. Uh, test scores are important in everything. Uh, but really, it's are you able to get into college, succeed, persistent college? Now, frankly, with Promise and Rick, Mary, and I, along with Dorsey Kendrick and, and Will, we've got a quorum. Um, <laughs> probably blame Frankie Lawson. Um, I, I think this whole idea of making this more seamless between uh, uh, primary and secondary school and, uh, and, and post, uh, post-secondary is really, really important and how we make sure kids persist and what kind of support we provide. And hearing, like, you know, we had this discussion once where um, I, I want to know if kids in math and co-op are not doing well. I want to know that as opposed to another high school. I want, just as I want to get feedback, if, you know, since like 85% of our certified staff have a degree from Southern one, of one kind or another, if, if the school education isn't doing its job. So I, 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 I tend to think it has to do about this whole idea of workforce and, uh, and education and lifelong, uh, lifelong learning is sort of the sweet spot. And, you know, it was, it was like you got to recognize the differentiation in schools. It was not a school of education at Yale. There's not they have other competencies, though, a few. And, um, you know, you take advantage of where you could. Now, uh, Rick, uh, Yale faced Quinnipiac in hockey. Uh, it was a four, four times this year. It was a new haven over Hampton victory. Right. And, and Quinnipiac won three of the four games when the chips were down. And when the chips were down, uh, I understand this is the first national championship you presided over as president of the university. In hockey, we've won, we've won national championships in squash and crew. And, uh, in, uh, I, I guess that's right. 
we're not talking to people about the uh, An audience question about New Haven Promise. Uh, the question says, uh, it looks like a great success and, uh, uh, and possibly a, uh, an important precedent nationally. And they go, go on to say in so many words, is it scalable and saleable? Uh, as a model for other cities nationally. Thoughts on that? Sure. I, I mean, first of all, we copied the idea from Kalamazoo, Michigan, and Pittsburgh, who already have this program. And in Kalamazoo, it's essentially funded by private philanthropy foundations that reside in Kalamazoo. And in Pittsburgh, it's largely funded by corporations. Uh, so the, the only novelty in this one is that it's essentially funded by, by university. Um, but, but, but the program has been very successful in those other cities, and it's been astonishing, so far astonishingly successful here, I think. Um, uh, the, the, we told you, there was talking a minute ago about, about persistence in college. So two years ago, the persistence rate between first and second year of college for the New Haven uh, high school graduates was 45%. In other words, 55% did not continue after the first year of college. Among the New Haven Promise recipients in the first cohort that started in September of sophomores, at 87% persisted. <laughs> and it's because we're following them. I mean, the, the whole of the program structure, we have a partnership with an organization called College Summit, which is a national uh, organization that both helps prepare high school students to think about being prepared and helps mentor of students in college to keep them retained. An organism, an NGO founded, by the way, by Yale graduate. And, and, um, and I think that, you know, we're the Promise staff and college are doing a great job, you know, keeping in touch with these students once they get to college and encouraging them to, to stay. And I, I, we're very hopeful that this performance will be repeated again this, this uh, summer and we'll continue to have high persistence. But this is a program that needs to be nurtured. Scalability was your question. You know, the, the it's you know the, we're fortunate that Yale's made the commitment to fund it up to a pretty ambitious level, and we would have to get private philanthropy if, it, if we got to the stage, let's say, where there were more than 200 or 250 students per class going on to one of these colleges. So far, it's not it's more like 100. So it's, it's uh, so it, it, it's it, for a number of years, it's going to be scalable at some point. We really get successful, uh, we'll need other sources of money. Yeah. John? I counted four observations or rebuttals. Um, one is we did, it was in the Wall Street Journal about Kalamazoo. And I talked to Rick, and Rick initially uh, put, it, put me off. And, and for a fair reason, though. And I took it as such, which was I didn't want to do it until he saw other movement in the school district. Um, fair enough, right? Yeah, you had been pushed back on that. Uh, and so after the teacher's contract, it was like my first phone call to Rick. It was like, okay, Rick, you know, time. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's true that um, I don't think it enjoyed, you know, it was occurring at a time that the university had some adverse um, financial circumstances. Departments in the university uh, were being asked to make cuts. And, you know, he's, you know, he's got his constituencies too, and I was aware of, aware of that. Um, second thing, which I just feel the need to do because it's an advertisement, College Summit's great, paid for by Yale New Haven Hospital, uh, Wells Fargo Bank, Wall Managed by Community Foundation. I just want to say that. Third, so here's the thing. It doesn't make sense at all on its own terms. Or actually, I want to say, actually say this uh, third. I think College Summit is going to become, we've talked about this, something else, which is much more focused on seeing these kids succeed, understanding why they succeed. It's going to be more than a scholarship program by the time it's, it's done, and I think that's really important. I really don't care if it's replicated anyplace else. And the fourth thing is is this. School reform in New Haven is three things. It is not just a promise program. In Kalamazoo and Pittsburgh, all they got is a scholarship program. Um, you have no other place where you have a teacher even an administrator evaluation system, such as you have in New Haven, where the union sits in meetings and tells tenured teachers they're done. 
no other place in America does this does this happen. Uh, this, this union has been heroic, this AFT union in this effort. You have no other place where you're grading schools. This tier ones, tier twos, tier threes turning around, taking out all of the adults, me and Annie. Um, I, I had a AFT vice president part of we're creating a monitor, a group of parents got together to create a Montessori. It's, it's fundamentally going to be a charter. And I have the union being part of advocating for this. You have no place else uh, where you've introduced through United Way sponsorship this idea of boost wraparound services, which is what we were talking about in West Rock so back 100 years ago um, when we tried that and it, it failed. New Haven school reform is comprehensive. It recognizes it's not just one path that does this. It is collaborative. We don't piss on each other as part of this, quite honestly. It's done together. And the third thing, which will prove to be the case, is not is persistence or not. And all of you, if you accept anything less than the coming years from this, because it is so easy, it is so easy to lose momentum, it is so easy to lose focus, and there are bruised feelings out there about this stuff, uh, you know, this one is on all of you to insist on your leadership starting July 1 and January 1 to not fritter away the efforts that have been made. And it's a big freaking deal to this uh, to this community. It is a big deal for these kids. These kids are great kids. They're talented kids. They can do this. They can do this. It's whether we as adults could live up to their promise, not the other way, uh, not the other way around. So it's going to be up to this community to decide this is really important. Taxes are important. I'm sorry about the 4% tax increase this year. That's a longer story. But this is really big deal stuff. John, you're pursuing that last topic about taxes. Is it cocktail time yet? It's Friday night. Yeah. There's a cocktail out there somewhere. Yeah, there's, there is a, there's a real issue about the, the structural ability of the city with its with its property tax reliance and the policies of the state to sustain its uh, its requirement of resources. And some large change has to happen. Some point, at some point in, let's say, the next 10 years uh, in order to make that make that work. Would you venture a thought or two on that? Yeah, I tried that in 2006. It didn't work out very well. You know, I mean, look, well, I, 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 mean um, I, I think so we're venturing someplace else. I, I think that um, it's going to be hard to do it the state and the economic circumstances it is. Um, I think the state needs to organize. I would hope the gubernatorial campaign is very much about a growth agenda for the state next year. Uh, I think when you're growing, it's possible to do other things. If you're not growing, you're just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Um, and I think there's reason if you look at New York, understanding it's got New York City and Boston, but you know, we somehow seem to be an outlier in growth uh, in not a good way right now. Um, so I think there needs to be um, um, a discussion about growth and how we're going to do that. And I think, you know, look, uh, this is all driven by land use. This is all the fault, as some of you have heard me say, of the Congregational Church, um, who, you know, Connecticut was laid out on greens with Congregational Churches, and people got angry, and Milford got founded. And when they walked out, and then they got angry, and West Haven got found. And you know what it is. Average Princeton got found. Yeah, you agree. Yeah. They, they, <laughs> well, it's how Davenport got here. I mean, uh, I mean, and so the, these land use issues, it's like I don't expect suddenly, um, who should we pick out? Every farm, which Woodbridge. I don't expect anytime soon congregate housing section 8. I mean, we're 70% rental. Trust me, when we're all dead, it's going to be 70% rental, and that's fine. And it's going to be third affordable, and that's fine. And those towns are not going to be, and that's fine. But let's articulate a growth and tax strategy that 
doesn't make it impossible for businesses in fam- the middle to be here. I mean, it's the middle that pays the price. So, I mean, but you got to do that in the context of growth. If you make it about affordable housing or some sort of stuff, it's just that not going to happen. Um, John, several people have suggested uh, that you might be a wonderful addition to the Yale faculty teaching about. They don't pay enough. <laughs> Where's the provost? The provost here, we got to talk. <laughs> Uh, we've got about a minute or two left. Uh, is there a valedictory goodbye from each of you? Rick, you first. Well, it's, you know, I think you can tell that um, what Doug said at the beginning that this, this really did become a genuine partnership. It's become a genuine friendship. I think we share a common vision for the city and, and, uh, and, and while we as he said, so well, we have our interests aren't completely aligned, but there's a huge area of overlap where what's good for you is good for me, and vice versa. And we've tried to make the most of that for 20 years, and uh, I think I, I know we both feel pretty good. That it's been it's been a good time. Uh, we've had a lot of support all around the community. The Yale community is, while it wasn't obvious, the only thing we've got support uh, uh, as much involvement in the city as we've had. It actually was not. A to be to be supported. You came to win at the university much tougher for you. And um, I'm really grateful for, for his uh, confidence, courage, and partnership. John? You, you know, I'll say this. I uh, said I came to the relationship with each other on my shoulder. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, and, I, and I feel, I got to tell you, I don't like ego. Uh, as you may know, um, I, I feel great over the last 20 years, but it's it's not like the projects, you know, what I, do, I remember mostly is people. Uh, and I'll tell you, and I, we talked about this a little bit, the experience both had since we announced we're working with people, but as they've mostly been to me, I've been lucky. Uh, terrific. I, I mean, what I leave this mostly with is what a good, decent man he is. And um, how much he's... No, he wasn't born here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, he, he's been important to the city and to the, and to the people. He's uh, helped me do my job, and I appreciate that, because it's not always an easy job. His job is not always an easy job, but it's been the best of jobs. And it's, it's you know, it's, I don't think it's the longevity. I, I, I mean, it just, it worked well. And I think as much as anything, it's the importance of character and temperament. And my friend here has a lot of character and temperament. And I'm grateful for that. So, thank you. And I hope they enjoy this. I hope they enjoy this.